Good morning. morning. How you doing? You lying to me? (laughs) Uh, I did that to someone recently and then they started crying. (laughs) Don't do that anymore. (laughs) That's called discernment. (sighs) If you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I'm also excited to be continuing in our Corinthians series. This is where we're looking at the biblical books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, letters actually from Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth, where they are experiencing issues. So many that some have called them crazy. So we are asking the underlying question through this entire series, are we any different? I think we got the answer to that, correct? Nope. Not so much. Dane did a great job last week holding down the fort, preaching on chapter 12. But I heard that the message wasn't the only thing that I missed. Apparently the thrift store was running a sale on tricliniums that I missed out on. Apparently they're coming back into fashion now. If you don't know what a triclinium is, you're going to have to go back, watch chapter 11. Where? I gave the historical context for the church in Corinth. I kind of showed you a picture of what it might have looked like. And so, it is fitting that today is pretend to be a time traveler day. Google it, look it up. Today is actually pretend to be a time traveler day. We have a holiday for everything, apparently. But it's pretend to be a time traveler day, just so we don't get that wrong. Pretend to be a time traveler day. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. You know what else it is? This is true. This is all true. I'm not just lying to you guys. It is National Brownie Day. National Brownie Day. Don't worry about the brownies in the lobby. So when we put those two things together, when we put those two things together, it's basically the best day ever if you're a stoner. So don't worry about the brownies in the lobby. You're good. (laughs) Just saying. We're not that kind of church. Yeah, I went there. (laughs) Base. Yeah, and we are going to be talking about the past, or putting things of our past aside. We're going to talk about holidays today. We're going to have some fun this morning, but not that much fun. Question, what are we willing to put aside for Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, like the Apostle Paul did? All right, we saw that in 1 Corinthians 9. Are we willing to put our gifts aside? That was the context from last week. He was talking about Things in the worship service. Chapters 11 through 14 of 1 Corinthians, there's overlying many themes that go throughout these letters. It was things that are happening in the worship service. So we had the use of the spiritual gifts, right? Some people are getting puffed up with their spiritual gifts in the worship service. And so Paul ends chapter 12 like this 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. But desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. What's that? Love. Now we arrive at what some call the wedding chapter. Why? Because even if you've never read your Bible, you've probably heard some of these verses at a wedding. Very popular for weddings. But now you have the context. So let's start at the top and we'll work our way through a little bit. 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 1. If I speak in human or angelic languages, some would say tongues, but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love. So before we begin with the biblical definition of love, and some interesting turns that we're going to take this morning, I want to address a typical teaching that if you've been in church for a long time, you've probably heard, 
We're going to look at some of the Greek words underneath the English translation in our Bible. And if you're churched, you probably know a little Greek. We're going to work on it together. So the teaching kind of goes like this. It's a good sentiment. It's a very, very good sentiment, but it's technically a little bit wrong. And it leads to what I'm going to call lazy love. Lazy love. Why? Well, here's how it goes. Let's just overview it in case you're new, you haven't heard it. Basically, it goes like this. Greek is a really complicated language. True. It has a lot of different words for love. True. Unlike the English language, false. That's where it goes wrong. We have a lot of different ways of saying love, as we will see in a moment, or expressing that sentiment. Two in particular in Greek, and you probably know them if you've been in church for a long time. Agape, right? And that's usually taught, range of teachings here, that it is a godly type of love. Some teachers will say, only God can love like that. Other teachers will say, no, we're called to love like that, but it's a higher form of love. Then there's philo, right? Remember this one? If you're in church for a long time. And that's kind of like a brotherly love, right? Think of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, philo. So you have these two different types of love. Now, God doesn't love with the philo because God is always agape, right? Or so it goes. If you went up to a Greek-speaking person, a Greek person, and said, say agapo, now don't be confused, I changed the ending a little bit. Greek is complicated in that way. The word endings change depending on what all else is going on in the sentence, what makes it really hard to learn. Agapo just means I love. Say agapo means I love you. Now, if you said say agapo to a Greek person, they wouldn't stone you to death and say, you're claiming to be God. <laughs> Only God can love like that. No, it would just mean I love you. They might say, well, we kind of need to go on a few dates first, but you could say it, say agapo. And they would just think you said, I love you. So we can say, say agapo. It's just fine. You can say that to your friends at church. And check this out, Titus 3, 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love, His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. You might be very surprised after hearing that teaching to learn that it does not say agape there. It says philanthropia. Think philanthropy. That's the word for God's love in that case. So you see how the teaching kind of gets it a little bit wrong. So we're going to talk about agape today or agape, but we're not going to worry about the pronunciations. Why? Because we're from America and we're just going to say agape and that's just fine. Don't worry about trying to be Greek. <laughs> we define, we define philanthropy as this. The desire to promote the welfare of others expressed especially by the generous donation of money to good causes. <laughs> we equate sacrificial love with money, probably because it's the most important thing to us. The fruit of real love is sacrifice. It is self-denial. This is what Jesus says love is. You've heard this one, been in church. John 15, 13, no one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. That is Jesus' definition of love. On agape love, John 15, 12, going back one verse, this is my commandment, Jesus says, love each other just as I have loved you. A couple of very interesting things, if you know Greek and you're reading it in Greek. One, that love there, he commands to love with, it's agape. Agape love. He commands us to love with the love of God. Just as, the Greek word kathos, just as. Jesus commands us to love just as he loved. No easy way out. John 15, 17, he says, I give you these commands so that you can love each other again. It's agape there. We are to have agape love for one another. Jesus doesn't give an easy way out. In fact, if you know about that chapter of John, John 15, he depicts us as a part of the Jesus tree, so to speak, right? He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Why? Well, we're supposed to represent him. By what? The production of good fruit, Jesus' fruit. We're supposed to be recognized by that. 
Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Read it again. And he tells us to do the same for others. John 15, 13. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Mark 8, 34. Summoning the crowd along with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. <clears throat> he doesn't say, follow me. <laughs> this is going to be easy. No, no. Deny yourself. Self-denial. Don't be selfish. Do. Pick up your cross. Could mean dying for someone. Could mean bearing someone else's burdens. Whatever. Then you can follow Jesus. Interesting. In chapter 13, Paul expands on that concept if we continue in the Corinthians text. Verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Did you notice? It says, bears all things. It's not talking about a bear like, no. No. <laughs> Bears, carries all things, endures all things. He's not selfish. Paul writes to the Galatians 6 2, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Jesus' brother James calls it the royal law. James 2 8, indeed, if you keep the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. The law of Christ is love. Biblical love is not the same as the way love is depicted in the world. It's not a feeling. Love in the world is selfish. Love in Christ is selfless. The world has created a counterfeit version of love so akin to lust that it can hardly tell the difference. When we look at this text and think back to ways in which Jesus loved, what comes to mind? He died for us on a cross? Yeah, pretty big. That's something else. He healed. He was very compassionate. He healed people. Especially the poor, the downtrodden, right? He had compassion for people. This morning, we're going to look at a way that Jesus loved, in which we don't normally associate with how Jesus loved. It's not usually the first thing that comes to mind. <clears throat> this is how I got there. It wasn't my doing. <laughs> I asked my wife. <laughs> That's what happened. You see, <laughs> I bounced my sermon ideas off my wife, Heather. <laughs> I'm not the first pastor to do this. Charles Spurgeon, great theologian, pastor in the mid-1800s, would review his sermon notes with his wife on Saturday nights. Smart guy. Why? Because <laughs> our wives are good at tough love. They're good at telling us the truth. So if I'm off, just ask her. <laughs> she's going to let me know. Even when I'm not, she's going to let me know. <laughs> She'll tell me her opinion about it. So, I bounced these ideas off of her. And she gave me back a question. What about the holidays? What about the holidays? Yeah, what about the holidays? How do people love during the holidays? What does that look like? Hmm. What does that look like? Yeah, you got a lot of people going places. Maybe they're seeing people they only see once a year for good reason. Maybe they got a crazy Uncle Joe. I slipped that in there. <clears throat> I don't know. Right? Not fun. How does love look? What does it look like? With boundaries. These are all interesting questions. So I'm like, thank you. Now I have to redo my message. <clears throat> Spent 20 hours on it. Anyway, that's where my message went. And went to this area. So what if I told you that love does not enable sin? What if I told you that Jesus... 
did not show love by enabling people. Now, this is what came to mind. If you've been in church for a long time, again, you've heard this one. But I'm going to point something out that maybe, maybe you hadn't thought of before. This came to mind. So, <clears throat> the story of the young rich ruler, the young rich man, right? Let's look at it again. Mark 10, 17. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good but one God, if that confuses you. There might be a tone of sarcasm there. You're not listening to me anyway. You do not believe that I'm God. But he goes on. You know the commandments, of course. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and father. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. Really? Then looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. (laughs) Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Hmm. Condition there before following him, huh? But he was stunned. The guy was stunned by this demand and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Among other things, did you notice that the rich man was happy to claim all the good stuff he was doing? Sure, whether he was doing it or not. <laughs> Instead of Jesus validating it, he pointed to the ma- where the man was lacking. Called him out. Prove it. Then follow me, step skipper. <laughs> the good did not cancel out the bad. That is what people will often try to do, especially when they want to manipulate a situation and stay in their sin. But look. Verse 21, Jesus loved him. So he told him the truth as opposed to giving him what he wanted. This meant letting him go. It doesn't say Jesus hated him. It says Jesus loved him. Love does not enable sin. Jesus knew that enabling someone wasn't loving them. And loving this man meant telling him the truth even if he would have to let him go. We might call this tough love. Here's our flawed logic in the world. That's it. This is our flawed logic equation. Love equals forgiveness equals making someone happy and letting them do whatever they want. Do we do that? Yeah. But love doesn't sin. Loving someone means being honest with them. That's hard. In parenting, it means disciplining your children. Not fun. In relationships, it can mean setting boundaries or sometimes letting them go. Real love is doing the hard stuff. Now, Jesus knew that when someone is in sin, they will twist scriptures sometimes to stay in that sin. Notice how the rich man validated himself from a whole bunch of scriptures, right? Jesus threw it out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Done all that. But what did he do? He left out his sin. He was happy to do that. He was glad that Jesus didn't list all 613 other commands. It says, because he loved him. So people do this. They do what he did. It's not unusual. In the app, I put some notes about how the devil did this with scripture. They do it to mask their sin. It will do a whole bunch of good things over here. Look over here, look over here, look over here. Or claim to do them. (laughs) To cover up or distract from the bad. But God still sees the bad. Not fooling anyone if we're doing those kinds of things. These people will not just manipulate the situation, but the narrative as well. Often backing it up with scriptures to suit their needs. Now, God knew that people might do this, (laughs) maybe. So he created counterparts to them so they couldn't be abused so easily. This is the balance of Scripture, the full counsel of God's Word that we need to have. That's why it's important. I like to think of it like this. I was mulling this over and bouncing the idea off a lot of different people this week. But the word balance came up a lot. Balance. 
When you balance things, though, they don't always go together, right? They can be two totally different things you can put on a scale and balance them. I was thinking about counterpart. I like that word. I think about marriage when I think about counterpart. I'm not a lawyer. I don't think in like legal terms, like it's like a copy of something. No. I think of it as a husband and wife. Think about that. They're different, but similar. They go together. When they're together, they complete one another, one flesh. They produce good fruit, hopefully. You get balance there. Now, this is often the balance required when abusive husbands use a text like this. Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, wives are to submit to their husbands in everything, and they stop there. But wait, there's more. Keep reading. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Note that in every Single instance, the root word to describe how a husband should love his wife is a form of agape. A husband should love his wife, kathos, just as Jesus loves his church. There is that counterpart scripture. Game changer, isn't it? It's created so that husbands can't manipulate, create a one-sided abusive situation if you know your scripture. Arm yourself with the word. Sometimes parents will do this as well. You've probably heard this one thrown around a little bit. Ephesians 6.1, children, obey your parents as you would the Lord. There it is again. Because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. And they stop there. But wait, there's more. Keep reading Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, don't, that means do not, stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I had to clarify that. People don't understand Greek, you know. <clears throat> parents they will often cite Exodus 20 right so we get the Ten Commandments in there fifth one ish I think I'm right honor your father and mother right so that it will go well with you in the land they rattle off some of the other ones sometimes and then they stop there but wait there are 603 more some of which apply to parents. Yeah. But they stop there. Now, the penalty for breaking some of these commands ranges. If we're going to the Old Testament, sometimes it's burning them. <laughs> Do not bring the propane tank and the to Christmas this year. No, 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 no. Drop the stone. That's what Jesus said. New covenant. <laughs> Stoning them, they could get stoned or cut off from the people. This is what Paul did. Remember the guy in chapter 5? His sin was Leviticus 20.11. The penalty? Death. I guess Paul was going easy on him by kicking him out of the church. The goal was reconciliation. Remember that. These commandments are like extensions of the ten that continue through the Old Testament. What if our parents are committing one of these sins? Hmm. Do we have to honor them? Or do we have to honor the Lord's instruction? You have to honor your parents. But only as far as they are keeping the instruction of the Lord. Honor your father and mother, but keep reading. If they sin, in some cases, they'll be cut off. What do you do with that? 
That's what it says in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. It was a protection for the community. That's the point. So, if you are playing that game and demanding the command of honor from your children going to texts like Exodus, you must keep reading and make sure that you're getting all the other commands right too. Works both ways. Or, have some self-reflection. Put the mirror up a little bit and think through it. We do have to honor our parents, but we do not have to honor their sin. Sometimes, you must honor, love, and forgive from afar. Simple as that. It is not required that you keep company with someone in sin. What is required is that you remove yourself from the situation or vice versa so that they don't bring you down with them. Paul said this in chapter 5. This was his reasoning. One lump spoils the whole batch. Right? It's like we think one bad apple. Honoring spouses or parents does not mean letting them abuse us. They're accountable for their sin. And that can mean cutting them off. Now, when looking at these situations, this is, this is the main thing. This is the real question that we should be asking, or the questions. Has the person we're dealing with found Jesus? Have they decided to follow Jesus? Okay, yes, no. If not, have I presented that option? You're accountable for that as a Christian. Do you know that? Have you presented them with that option? Backing up. If they said they've decided to follow Jesus, and they're not acting like it, well, if it walks like a duck, Paul says, chapter 5, don't have anything to do with a person like that. It's what it says. Have you presented the option? If not, have they chosen to follow Jesus, to be a part of his family? As a follower of Jesus, you're obligated to ask those questions, present the invitation to people to join the family. And if they choose not to follow, or to follow, which will be evident by their actions. That's what Jesus says. Judge a tree by what? The fruit. Sometimes, loving them means letting them go. Like Jesus did with the rich man or Paul, the guy in chapter 5. Now, to be clear, hear me now. Reconciliation is the goal. And I'm not saying to stop hanging out with people in the world, right? Otherwise, Paul says we'd have to leave the world. I am saying that if someone is causing you to sin, acting as a bad influence, abusing or manipulating you, then you should love them from afar, especially if they're pretending to be a believer. This is what Paul says in chapter 5. We're taking advantage of their relationship with you as a family member or friend. Wolves in sheep's clothing. God is first. Following Jesus, our relationship with Jesus, overrides every other relationship in our lives. That's what he says. So if someone is causing you to sin or disobeying him, you must honor them from afar. This could be a loved one who's a bad influence, someone you are enabling in sin, or even a parent who's provoking you to sin. Someone who is truly a part of Jesus' family doesn't act like that. Jesus is in a house. Backdrop. Mark 6.31. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, Look, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters are outside asking for you. He replied to them, Who are my mother and brothers? And looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Whoever does Jesus' will is your family now as a Christian, not by our blood, by his. No, it's not just the children that Jesus raises the standard for, it's also the parents. Matthew 10, 34, he says this, Don't assume that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. 
The person who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Check it out. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and then follow me is not worthy of me. Now, the point is not about a literal sword or violence. The point is not that we go out of our way to make our families hate us. It is that when we choose to follow Jesus, really follow Jesus, and raise the standard in our lives, usually that doesn't make our families happy. When we disavow the drama that comes from sin, people who like drama aren't usually very happy. It happens. Now, some of you, some of you, maybe one or two people here, <laughs> I got to deal with it, <clears throat> might be getting self-righteous at this point and thinking, I don't have any problems with my family. I love my family. They're great. They love me. We always get along when we're drinking and everything's fine. <laughs> right? Okay. Maybe you are going to Kirk Cameron's house this Christmas where everything is perfect. Maybe I'm just upset because I wasn't invited. All resentment against Kirk never invites me to Christmas. It's because I used to have a crush on his sister, but whatever. I'm over it. But if you're not invited to Kirk's house this year, and you're like the rest of us, you got some family who's decided not to follow Jesus. Or worse yet, decided to fake it. But if you're still thinking that you don't have family problems like the rest of us, could it be? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, that your family doesn't have a problem with you because you haven't changed. Because you're still acting like them and not like Jesus. Ouch. Think about it. You're supposed to be like Jesus. It's a tall order. People don't like it. Ooh, you're so perfect. This happened to me. I won't go into the details, but when I got convicted, I really decided to start following Jesus. Change. Do things a little differently. Less bad words. Working my way to none. Not being crazy, doing crazy things. My friends didn't like me anymore. They actually said, Where's old Gene? I like old Gene better. He's more fun. New Gene isn't any fun. No, I wasn't even really calling them out. It was just simply my behavior alone that caused them to go, Ooh, Christian. Ooh. These were my friends. It happens. Jesus, he draws a line in the sand. That is the sword that divides. It causes division, and that's okay. We have to be okay with saying, I'm not going down that road of sin with you anymore. Sorry. Or maybe, I'm not coming to the fight anymore. I'm not doing it. <laughs> Just every year, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm done. That's okay. It's okay to let it go and be like Jesus. Now, we hope to be a positive example, but if we're not, we're enabling sin. When we play along, we enable the sin. We hope, as Paul did with the guy from chapter 5, for reconciliation. I like to believe he came back. We'll get to it in 2 Corinthians. Jesus' brother James mocked him. Read John 7. Mocked Jesus. But he went on to be the head of the church in Jerusalem. We hope for reconciliation. But anyone, anyone who causes you to compromise your relationship with Christ is not your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, or your friend. That's the bottom line. So I want to give you guys some encouragement. Some holiday encouragement this year. I like to think of the worldly holidays that are not in the Bible as hallmark holidays. They're all, they're, it's all about business. All of it. 
You might be astonished to find out that Thanksgiving is not in the Bible. They wouldn't have known about that for like 1,700 years. Christmas, it's not in the Bible. It ain't there. The birth account, all that other stuff, it's there. But nowhere does Paul say, thou must celebrate Christmas on December 25th. If you don't buy presents for your parents and kids, you've sinned. It doesn't say that there. You might be shocked to find out that pretend to be a time traveler day is not in the Bible. Sorry, big disappointment, stoners. National Brownie Day isn't in there either. Oh, you shouldn't be getting high anyway. <clears throat> I have a lot of friends. <laughs> told you we'd talk about the past. I have a lot of friends from different denominations. I'm going to share a little something with you. It's kind of interesting. We can put it on the table. Leave it up to you to take it or not. One of my friends is a Nazarene. If you know anything about this, we talked a little bit about this at Bible study. They're very strict. The women still wear the head coverings that we talked about a couple weeks ago. All right, so they're really literal, way too literal for my taste, but I don't talk about that. I'll talk about the main thing, don't want to get in an argument. They're really legalistic, is what I don't say that to them, but they don't celebrate anything, no holidays, if it isn't in the Bible. And they kind of take Colossians out of context. I'm not going to go there right now. No holidays, nothing. Not even birthdays. First, I had to keep my mouth shut. When I heard this, I was like, you don't know, never mind. <laughs> Come to Bible study. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, oh, it took me a minute. I had to exhibit some self control of my mouth. Anyway, <laughs> but then the holidays came. And that legalism switched in my mind to liberating. Think about it. Think about all the nonsense we go through on holidays. It just has nothing to do with Jesus. Who told us this was important? Corporations, I don't know. They come up with these things, you know what I mean? Like Montgomery Ward and Vince Rudolph, and now there's Rudolph. You know, it's just crazy. And just think about, and that's true, think about all the things that we do on these stupid holidays sometimes. How much money do we spend buying presents that we don't even need? I come up with a list of things I could just buy for myself all year just so that my family members can buy them for me. It makes no sense. I don't need anything. Think about it. And do we have budgets? Think about Just think about it with me for a moment. It's Christmas. We're celebrating Jesus' birth, Right? Jesus have a lot of stuff? No, but we celebrate it by setting a budget of like hundreds of dollars so we can buy each other things instead of giving to the poor like he did. So we do the opposite of what Jesus would do on Christmas. Man, I was thinking, I want to be a Nazarene this year. That's it. I'm out. I'm out. I'm done. They wouldn't let me. <clears throat> so ask yourself the question this year. Are these holidays... Are these holidays opportunities or are they obstacles? Think about it. So I'll give you an example from my life. Two holidays this year were opportunities. Halloween was an opportunity. No, I do not believe that 99% of the kids in my neighborhood wearing Disney costumes asking me for candy are worshiping Satan. Highly doubtful. Maybe one or two of them, but not a lot. All right, so I look at it as an opportunity. Ding dong, the ring of door. No, it's weird here in Florida. We sit in the driveway. It's really weird. Like, I, I don't know. I like it better because when it's late, they don't come to the door. Anyway, they come to the driveway. We give them candy. We don't dive behind the couch. We give them candy. And they have a little parents' night out card, youth group card in there, depending on their age range. We have separated into two different divisions, well calculated and organized. We give them the youth group card. Here's a place you can go and not worship Satan. Even if they were worshiping Satan. Aren't those exactly the people we're supposed to be talking about? We're talking to? Why do we always hang out with Christians? Christians? That would be exactly the person we should be talking to. Someone who's worshiping Satan. Yo! <laughs> Gotta talk! Not good. Another opportunity. The beach service. Christmas Eve. I'm viewing that as an opportunity this year. Why? I know a lot of people there, they're going to come. They're more interested in sunsets and Santa Claus. They don't care about Jesus. But 
meet them where they are on the beach and talk about the real reason for the season. So yeah, I'm going to talk about the holiday stuff, but then I'm going to talk about Jesus. It's an opportunity, right? What about obstacles? For us this year, Thanksgiving was an obstacle. So I became a Nazarene. I went to Disney World. (laughs) So if these holidays are obstacles for you, I want to give you an alternative this year. Come celebrate Christmas with me on the beach. Christmas Eve. I think it's still December 24th. Nazarenes didn't change it. Come worship with me on the beach. We'll worship Jesus. It'll be great. No drama, I promise. And I also want to give you another invitation. If you have not decided yet to become a part of Jesus' family, I want to invite you to do that. Come get baptized. We're going to do that too at the beach. So, if you want to get out of the drama and enter into a life of joy that can only be found in Jesus, love that can only be found in Jesus, I want to extend that invitation to you. If you are a part of the family, mothers, brothers, sisters, come on out. Worship with me this year. You can still do Christmas or you can come see Star Wars with me on Christmas Day. <laughs> Another opportunity after the service. It's a real thing. <laughs> after the service today, come and join us in the loft. Break bread with us. No drama, I promise. Amen? God bless your week.